My name is Dr. Anthony Rizzi, and I'm a physicist who has taught at University of Colorado, Princeton, and LSU, and have also been involved as senior scientists at the California Institute of Technology for the gravity wave detector called LIGO. It stands for Laser Gravitational Wave Observatory. And I've taken some time off to write a book called The Science Before Science, which is what this lecture series is based on. Many will say that the world goes around the sun. Actually, uh, I think you could make the argument that the world revolves today around modern science. And particularly, it's probably very evident to people technology, which comes out of the science, is controlling our world. But a lot of people haven't thought that our very thinking is controlled by modern science. I'll give you a few examples, the Earth's rotation, the Earth's revolution, and the, and the shape of the Earth. How many of you actually feel like you're moving at 1,000 miles an hour? How many feel like you're, going, like you're on the surface of a ball that's doing that? How many feel like you're moving 67,000 miles an hour around the sun? Uh, and why do you believe these things? I mean, this is not even a faith, because a faith is something you acknowledge is, is coming from somewhere that you haven't, uh, you're trusting something. It's a blind faith, because you don't even realize it's a faith why you believe these things that are so uh, apparently averse to what you see. Uh, for example, the roundness of the Earth. And you haven't flown around in space and looked back. Most of us haven't. You haven't flown around the world keeping your, following your nose and going uh, to see that the world is round. And, you know, there's a comparison often made, often made to medieval man. And he's said to be backwards because he had this faith in the Bible. Well, their faith at, at least was an acknowledged faith. Our faith in science is a blind faith. Many think that this discovery that the Earth is round, for example, is a discovery of modern science. Indeed, medieval man knew that the Earth was round. Now, another example from science that people are, learn very early is about the atom. We're taught the atom is made of a nucleus and an outer part called the electrons. And to give you a scale size for this, what we're often told is if the nucleus is the size of a basketball, then the edge of the atom is like two miles away. And reasoning goes further from this, because when people are taught this, they aren't explicitly told this, but it's behind the scenes, that, look, well, that means that, you know, there's mostly nothing in an atom. And so if we're mostly nothing, does that mean that all the common sense things that seem to tell us that things aren't mostly nothing, including us, are not true, and that our senses themselves are not trustworthy? Um, of course, this is not true. The senses themselves were used to get what we know about the atom. Science is actually a second or third level of knowledge, or fourth level of knowledge, in, when it comes to talking about the atom. Uh, indeed, the fact that we can do science is already showing that we're far from nothing, that we're capable of profound understanding. And so we kind of, we kind of, got to remember where we start from. We'll talk more about that later. But science seems to generate this nihilism. It seems to j cause this sort of thinking of ourselves as, as not as important as maybe we once thought. We have to understand this if we want to understand our culture. Science is um, pr prevalent, at, as we've seen, and even in our thinking. And, but the, there's also this negative effect that we just talked about, like that comes from deductions from things like the atom. Some argue it's science's fault, and here's how they argue. They say science is very mechanical and unconcerned with the individual dignity of a man, more concerned with how to make things go. Uh, and then scientific theories like relativity, which we'll talk about, and quantum mechanics, have supposedly undone things like causality and what we know about time, sort of robbed us of all our connection with our ancestor. Our human patrimony has been kind of ripped away from us, they claim. And it's alienated man from himself. We have nuclear weapons, cloning, pollutions, machines replacing uh, man in, in all kinds of environments. And furthermore, you have this split now that C.P. Snow, Snow talked about, the humanities on one side and science on the other side, and science is often blamed for this. And as sci this science-centered culture has gone further, 
And it seems to have generated within itself this de a deconstructivist mentality, which says that everything is a mere construct of ourselves. So is science in some sense suicidal? Alan Sokol, the physicist who recently wrote an article that I describe in the book that I won't go into here, sort of seems to demonstrate that there is this suicidal tendency that has generated not within science so much, but within the culture generated by science. So is science the problem? Well, even the most violent haters of science or scoffers at science or, or dislikers of science would acknowledge there's convenience, and that includes advanced materials that allow us to do all kinds of things. The sanitary conditions, the medical things, the information technology, including the very video you're watching now, computations and commu advanced communications, cell phones, all kinds of things that science has given us. So we can't say it's science itself. What is the problem here? Well, you have to say science has a crude negative so that the problem is something's missing. It's not that science itself is bad, but something has been left out. And that something is philosophy. Philosophy is the study of the first principles of all things. It comes from the Greek philia, sophia, love, literally love of wisdom. It satisfies our highest need, which is a need to know. We need this science that comes before science, and we'll see in many ways that we need it, not the least of which is to protect our culture from this suicidal tendency. And philosophy, as Einstein said, and Aristotle said before him, depends on this childlike wonder, of wondering about the world and what the world is like. So to fix this problem that's been linked with science, so we need to reawaken our sense of awe, and we'll do that by doing philosophy. And in particular, I want to bring out an example here that I saw as a teenager that really enkindled my sense of, of awe, one of the things that kept me on my path to going into physics, and that is the, this Maxwell speed curve. This speed curve was figured out in the 1800s, and these measurements were done in 1955. And you see that they fell exactly on the curve. This is something of revealing something of the order and beauty of, the, of creation. Those types of things are, are the things that are going to pull us through and help us to try and see what, what the problem here is with science and at the same time help us learn better what the things are important and what are the baseline things and what are the things that come out of those baseline things. We've already begun our efforts in philosophy, as you might have already guessed, because by examining the roots in these three examples, we've already started asking questions about what things mean. We found out that we need this science before science, and this before, we already started to use in a, in a non-material way, in a, if you will, a non-chronological way. It's, it's more like what, it's not like the before in the, the, in the sense of a, the engine comes and then after that comes a coal car. The coal car, the engine doesn't come before the coal car. And that, I mean, we're not using before in that literal sense. We're using it in the sense that a side comes before the concept of a triangle. A triangle is a something with three sides. So in order to think of a triangle, you first have to have the idea of a side. So we're using before in this general sense. So we've already started diving into the philosophical ideas. Philosophy is unavoidable. To try to say you don't need it is already to start doing it. So let's, let's dive into this and, and look in the issues of knowledge and belief, because this is kind of where we started, and see what we can learn by our three examples. Now let's talk about the Earth's motion first. In, in here, knowing and believing, as we saw, is in, intertangled. And we want to make some distinctions here. And to do this, we want to be precise, but we don't want to logic chop. We don't want to chop things off just so they can fit into our head. We want in, in analogy to what Einstein did with the theory of general relativity, he came up with a cosmological constant whose only purpose was to make the universe static. But when he found out that experiments said the universe wasn't like that, he threw it away. And we have to watch out for what happens if we try to logic chop too much in answering these types of questions. What happened to Kant was he came up with a whole system in which he said that, that non-Euclidean geometry was impossible. Well, you know, the whole theory of general relativity is based on non-Euclidean geometry. It's what happens when you try to lock yourself into an idea system and not let the world uh, con conform yourself to the world, but try to conform the world to your ideas. Hegel did the similar thing. He 
said there can't be any planets between Mars and Jupiter. There just can't be. He came up with a whole theory why there couldn't be. And of course, this is where the asteroid belt is, which is a bunch of little, many, many thousands of little planets. And Leibniz did a similar, similar thing with his best possible worlds. So we need to keep in mind that philosophy is a real science. It requires real work. You have to think about it and process it the way you, you would, the effort with at least as much as how much you'd have to put into to any other science. Let's start making distinctions. Knowledge used generally, as we generally use it, is improper knowledge. It's knowledge that we've not sorted out uh, rigorously. Proper knowledge, and we're going to use the word to distinguish, would be something that I have seen and or reasoned to myself, as opposed to taking the word of another. So we're trying here in philosophy is to make everything we can into proper knowledge as opposed to improper knowledge, which is really a species of belief. It's something that you're taking the word for somebody, at least partially, as, re as opposed to getting it on your own understanding. You cannot know and believe something in the same way at the same time. I can say I believe my friend, I believe he's right or correct because I know his character and his character um, it informs that, but I cannot know and believe the same thing at the same time. I can do it in different ways. So starting with, again with the motion of the earth, you learn this as a child. You may not have thought about it, but you take that on the authorities of your teachers. And it's not just a belief, it's a belief hanging from a chain of beliefs. Because your teacher was told by another teacher, who was told by another teacher, who was in turn told by maybe an expert who didn't take it on his own word either, who took it from somebody who actually did the experiment. So there's a whole chain of beliefs there. And this all depends on the trustworthiness of the authority that you're taking it from. So this what what we call infrascientific knowledge. Experience that has not been philosophically examined, which would include the beliefs that you get from authorities that you've learned to trust. But mostly, there's a lot of things in there that we can examine that are your direct experience that we can rigorously analyze and test whether they're true or not. Scientists now, even with something like the motion of the Earth, scientists have more certainty than a non-scientist, but it's not the certainty of uh, proper knowledge, it's the certainty of faith based on authority. But there's these interlocking things, like scientists will know about inertia. For example, he'll know that in a train, if the train is running smooth, he will have thought about the fact that the laws of physics act exactly the same in the moving train as they would in a, in a room that's not moving with respect to the ground. So he has these interlocking things whereby he can check this, faith, this improper knowledge, which we do in a lot of ways as well with other types of knowledge. So if you've become, gotten good at this, you kind of can sort things out a little bit. But it's still improper knowledge, at least in some degree. The roundness of the Earth now is also a level of trust here. You're, you, the astronauts, if you talk to an, an astronaut, that would be a first level of trust because you get it from somebody who saw it. The satellite pictures, well, this is uh, something you might say, well, wait a second, I've seen a satellite picture. Well, just because you've seen a satellite picture doesn't really mean that you have proper knowledge. In fact, it means you don't because unconscious faith in science makes you believe that that is proof. But there's at least two tiers of faith involved here. One is you're trusting the publication that, that the thing, that the, when they published it, that they didn't distort the picture or, or invent it or whatever. Um, and for example, the shape of the continents. Everyone thinks that he knows this is North America. But in fact, very few people have been up high enough to see that that really is North America. They, they say that this is the globe, and they say this is the Earth, because very young they were told this, and other people point to it and said this is the Earth. The shapes of these continents are similarly not seeable at the levels that um, we normally view things. And matter of fact, if you think back in time, at one point nobody saw these things, only the surveyors themselves knew it by their calculations. And, and, and with a camera, the second level of, level of trust comes in is we're trusting the camera designer that he designed the camera correctly so that the picture actually is what it, what it says it is. And if you know cameras, again, you get this interlocking knowledge that can kind of help as a, as a way to say this is a believable thing. So we take, we, what we do, we tend to do unconsciously, and we want to make all this stuff conscious, 
is we test an authority. We, we take that no improper knowledge and we want to make it proper knowledge by seeing if something the authority tells us is true. And the more we find that that authority is true, the more we then trust it. Now, you know, as far as we're concerned, for most of us, the world could look like this. We've not been up high enough to see it. Or the continents could look like this, how the people thought it looked in 124 AD. And just to bring home the questionability of photos, which is how we really, the, you know, again, it's, it's faith based on authority. We trust this authority and we have good reason. There's a lot of interlocking evidence. But just to show you that, that it is improper knowledge is people have questioned seriously the Apollo mission, whether it really happened. And some of these claimants say, look, there's too much dust sticking to the, in the footprints. That, that wouldn't happen. And look, there should be a lot more stars in the pictures. Well, the average non-scientist is not going to be able to sort that out. And uh, he's going to may maybe call into question because it's the questionability of photos that is at issue here. But of course, there's a little doubt that men landed on the moon. We have converging evidence from many directions. But the point here is not that, that this is virtual certainty that man landed on the moon. There is because of these converging lines. If we take the, pe the people and authorities that we know and the thing, other things they say, we can see that this, this is most likely true. Very little doubt. But still, the point is, it's not like the knowledge you have of this stack of papers when it's in front of you or when you're reading your book. That, that is proper knowledge in the sharp sense. Proper knowledge is knowledge that can be based on reasoning that you've done yourself and, and experiences that you've had yourself. So for example, when you're reading my book, you know that there is an author of the book, me. And you can deduce that. You don't necessarily know who I am, but you know somebody wrote it. That's a, a, a proper knowledge. Now, the more complicated the set of reasoning is, the more complicated the information you have, the more likelihood of error. But all of us depend on this improper knowledge. We can't know everything with a proper knowledge. There's just too many things to know. M but much of it, as I said, has a virtual certainty. And this is the matter of prudence of, of who you, what, whether you're trusting the right authority or not in, in the right, for the right area. But this is a gain in proper knowledge to see that we depend on each other in this way. No scientist even can do all the experiments, as I noted before. Scientists depend on the fact that other people have done the experiments. He can check to make sure that things are not inconsistent with things that he knows, but he can't do the detail, every detailed experiment, especially outside of his subfield. The foundations of science, then, are, we're starting to see here that the science before science is we have to set this down as the bottom level groundwork for science. The only option left is irrationality because if we reject the ground of our thinking, that is the, the things that we know immediately, then you end up with an anti-rational tendency and that anti-rational tendency has two directions. One is subjectivity, where you just take everything that you, you self experience as all of reality and don't rigorously analyze it because you don't expect that there, there's a real world out there to, to conform to. Or fideism, where you, you completely deny your, the ability of your reason to understand things. And both these things end up being a denial of reason itself. Of course, you can deny this ground level, the existence of this ground level, by not following the logic through. For example, one can say he doesn't accept a fundamental principle, but he can't really do it in fact. For example, a fundamental principle like there is truth. If you try to say there is not truth, well, is that true? Well, if it's true, then it's not true. You can't do it. You can put the words out there. It has no meaning. So you can say these things, but you can't really live them. And this is the nature of all fundamental error. By the very act of articulating it, you give it more than it really has to begin with. And this is, a, you know, this is a, when you're talking about a fundamental principle, this is uh, very clear. But it's also true of error of any degree. To the degree that the error is serious is the degree that you won't be able to do it. But error, in essence, is a lack or privation in the order of your knowledge. It only exists because of the knowledge that's there that you've perverted in some way. So in a sense, error is nothing. So if you're unaware of this science before science, what's going to happen? You're going to 
modern sciences are very specialized now, and anybody that knows, like even in physics, there's many sub-branches. And then within those sub-branches, there's often branches. What unifies these sub-branches? You know, there's got to be a ground for all these sub-branches, and there's got to be interconnections between them. Well, you cannot do a s only specialized sciences because then each of these branches is like a uh, tr branches floating in the air without a tree to hang on to. And so they're unstable with respect to crossing boundaries from one field to the other. Sound philosophy is the only remedy to keep this instability from happening. And this is basically what we've already seen, that the sciences tend to, this is why the sciences tend to breed sort of their own destruction if they're not checked by uh, out external forces. And we'll talk more about that later. Truth of this type that we're talking about, this foundational level, the starting level from the senses up, is a, doesn't depend on particular expertise. It just depends on having personal experience. This is so-called common, common experience because we all have, we're all have a human nature. So this is thinking that everyone does spontaneously to a more or less degree, but not rigorously. And that's what philosophy is going to do, is do, do this rigorously and with care. So what about the atom? Didn't we say that the atom was a particular uh, mode of falling into the error of science being uh, indicating that we're kind of worthless? Well, it looks like it's pretty hard to refute because uh, if an atom is mostly nothing and we're made out of atoms, how do we unwind this? Well, we're, the point is, again, to remember we're more certain of our existence than we are of atoms. And this is maybe hard for those not educated in the sciences to comprehend, but in the sciences you get so used to the idea of an atom, and even in our uh, broader culture, that you forget that we don't know an atom except by way of our senses, except by way of knowing other things first. And so, indeed, we're going to want to ask the question, how do we even know atoms exist? You have to take a double take here, like we did with the, the the rotation and the revolution of the Earth. Atoms are not just a second or third level of knowledge. Indeed, they're a part of a web of knowledge, of one concept linked to another in very complicated theory. So we know we're not mo mostly nothing, so now the problem becomes how to unwind what's really happening in the, in, the, in the logic of this. Well, since we have this complicated logic that leads to an atom, there must be something wrong in the premise. And we'll talk about this as we go along in the course. The real danger here to note is that when you convert physics, modern physics, to everyday language, you have to be very careful. There's a difference in mode of explanation. And let me just give an example of that. Explanation can happen at various levels. Modern science has become specialized to one narrow mode that typically excludes the philosophical, excludes these common experience, this spontaneous thinking part of man. For example, if you assume that you're a two meter by a quarter meter cylinder, all made out of water, you quickly calculate that you're 10 to the 28 atoms. And, but, you know, think about it. Are you 10 to the 28 atoms or are you one? Are you one thing or 10 to the 28 things? And the fact is, is that we have to come back and have a lot more philosophical understanding before we can answer that. But this tells us right away that reality is not univocal. It's not one level as the specialized sciences tend to operate on. Rather, it's heterogeneous, it's multiple layered. It's not a song with one note, it's a song with multiple voices that can make up chords. So infrascientific experience then is the experience of living but not clearly thought out about. So as we live, we do these things and we spontaneously reason about the experiences that we have, but we don't do it rigorously. So what we want to do in philosophy is rigorously do this. And science, by the way, this science before science, the science that grounds science, is, comes from the Latin word scientia, which means knowledge. And we want to try to take our improper knowledge and convert it to proper knowledge. The, ba the, better, the base of our improper knowledge, the more likely that it will succeed and the more likely that we'll be given confidence by, by the, those successes to move on and really develop a trust in our intellectual capacities. And this is where it's important, again, to remember the cultural milieu. Because if your cultural milieu is giving you or your authorities that you've trusted are giving you things that are false, when you test them and find out they're false, cynicism might develop. To conclude our discussion of knowledge and belief, 
to, to really hone this in on before we go in and we really dive into the philosophy. And that is uh, St. Anselm's quote in the 1100s, and we convert this from Latin, that someone did, as I believe that I may understand. And that, that in turn can be mistranslated as, or misunderstood as, I, I believe that I can understand. I believe that I can understand. Now, that's a nice statement, even though it's a mistranslation of what Anselm meant in one way. It means not that we, we have to believe that we understand, because we, we know we understand, we know things. We don't have to believe that. But it gives, a, if the culture has this belief, it gives a confidence to people to continue to explore and understand things at a deeper level. I believe that I may understand. Of course, this, the correct translation of this, I believe in order to understand or faith seeking understanding um, is not so different because basically what it's saying that if you have a good cultural environment that's given you true information, then when you test it, reason's confidence will be built up and as a, as a culture you'll not develop cynicism, you'll not give up on the power to, on, on wanting to know and understand, you'll uh, do the opposite. Of course, if you have bad sources, then cynicism can develop. So we found now in our, basically the mistakes in the three examples were to do with origins, where we started from. We have to start from a ground. And those other things, we have to find out what we know more, what we know more certainly, and then we move from what we know more certainly to, to that which we know less certainly. So we start with first things first, and that's what we want to do to really ground our thinking. And I want to give an example here just to show you how important it is to do this again, because uh, it, it's sometimes uh, not notice how much we've gone into subjectivism in our current modern culture. There is a student of mine, I'll call him Bill, that's not really his name, but to keep an anonymity here. He, th he had an argument with me that he was convinced that reality wasn't real, that everything was just an appearance. And it took me a good five minute conversation to remind him that everything that he knew came from people, real people or real books, even the things that were untrue came from real things. And finally, he realized that what I was saying was obviously true. How can this happen? Well, I mean, how can we get to a state where people don't know that the real is really real? Well, the way it can happen is that little errors in the beginning lead to huge errors later on. That's why we need to ground the sciences. That's why we need to find the bottom link of the sciences and make sure that's a stable base. An example is, uh, Aristotle gives this example of an arrow that if you shoot an arrow and you're just a little bit off, by the time the thing gets to the target way far away, it can be and miss the target by a lot. What's the first thing then we know? Well, science depends on the fact that we know that the world is real. That's what it's trying to do is understand the real world. Well, the first thing we know is that there is an is. That is that things exist. We know that, may, say the first time, you know, you're that the, you're a baby inside your mother and you hit the uterine wall, you, f you, have, you touch and then you know there is something out there. It's before you even know that you're a self that you know that there are things out there. Now, we talked about logic chopping and the, the dangers of logic chopping. And that comes from not wanting the world to be as full and as complete as it is, but wanting it to be understandable immediately in a clear way by yourself. And this is why Descartes, wanted all things to be like mathematics because mathematics in one way is very much has this set of clear ideas and it's very connatural we'll talk about that later to our ways of knowing and St. Thomas is saying this in the Middle Ages that be careful because mathematics has a temptation to subsume all because it's so connatural with the way we think so natural you might want to say now until we define that word so he thought he could doubt everything he thought he could just systematically doubt everything and then start with himself in his mind. So he, and then he, from there he deduced, he thought, God, and from God he got back at the whole world. Of course, if you start in your head, there's no way out. If you have no connection with the outside world, then you have no connection. There's no way out. And Descartes, Descartes was, was wrong. Um, in his starting point because the self is not what you know first. You know things first. Existence precedes even the essence of the thing, even what the thing is. And 
Descartes, in pretending to, to think he knew himself only first, of course, was only pretending because he knew lots of other things that were in his mind that he, that he then used to get himself out. The point is we have to really ground things. And we have, so that means we have to be very careful about what comes first. And by the way, this point of view of trying to start with, with your ideas is called philosophical idealism, where you think ideas are real and that you know, only know them or you know them first. So we know everything through our senses. That's how we get everything. We, and touch is primary in that. If we want to see something's real, we reach out and we grab it. And as I mentioned, that you know, inside the placenta, you, you may have felt their first, but you didn't know yourself was a self at that point. You just knew that there was something out there. You're aware of things. It was much later that you were aware that you, were, you yourself were aware of those things as a self. And you know, the, the, one of the reasons that touch is so primary is because of the fact that it's not mediated. There's nothing between you and the thing when you're touching it. Whereas with, you know, if I'm looking at the wall, there's light mediating it, or sound in the case of hearing. Of course, ta taste involves some touch, but it's restricted in an obvious way. So common, you might say common sense is telling us all this stuff, but that's exactly the point. We want to try and defend the, the common sense, uh, see if we can defend it from a rigorous point of view, rather than just saying, well, vaguely common sense says it's true. So we, can we really trust our senses? Let's ask this in a rigorous sense. Well, senses put us in contact with individual things. The primacy of the senses in, is in jeopardy because of the specialized sciences. And, we, the, and how that, has that happened? Well, we've seen a little bit. But let's review. We forget the atom is not primary. The motion of the Earth is not something we know first. And indeed, most of us, we already saw and only know it by belief. Shape of the earth is not primarily known for us. Sensorial data that things exist is what is primary. Now, what is, what is primary? Well, the sensorial data that there is relative motion between the earth, sun, and moon, you can watch and you can see that there's a relative motion between us and the sun. The sun, we even say it today, the sun rises. We say it rises, even though we know from our science improperly, of course, but um, with virtual certainty that, this, that it's not the sun that's moving, but it's the earth. But the point is, is what, that's because what's primary for us is the relative motion. That's what we see. The sensorial data that the earth is locally flat is our primary thing. That's what we see. We look around, the earth looks kind of flat or hilly or whatever. It doesn't look round. And the other thing is we cannot sense uniform motion. Remember the, the example of the train. When you're in a train, if the train's running smoothly, Everything, unless you look out the window, everything feels the same as it did when you were sitting still. So this is not, this is what we call a negative error. It's the senses aren't false. It's just that you've made a false conclusion because the senses have limits. But let's look and see if the senses are trustworthy. Because that's really what we're boiling down to here. And let me give you an example of, when I was at MIT and, and as an undergraduate, the, there's sort of a either... A sort of partially conscious uh, way that professors have in physics departments of making you feel as if all your common sense, all the things you thought you knew were not true. And one of the things that they did in this freshman or this sophomore physics class, I believe it was, is they took two black and white slides and they showed th them on the screen. This one and this one here separate. And then they Combine the two black and sl white slides, putting a red filter in one of the projectors only, and voila, full color picture appeared. So, whoa, what's wrong with our senses there? And another example, and I'll come back and talk about this more, but right now I want to lay out the paradoxes here. And another one is this is Fetchner's disk. And I lay out in the book how to make one of these. And uh, there's a web page as well. And if you rotate this disk, you see red and green in the middle here, even though the thing is black and white when you stop it. Another thing is a TV scanning. I mean, a TV, when you look at a TV, it looks like a fixed picture, but it's really not. It, the TV is really a scanned electron beam hitting the, the phosphorus screen. So how are we going to unwind this? Well, the temptation might be to go and do a bunch of uh, really specialized experiments. Go into a lab and get some laser beams and, and do some calculations, but that's not what we want to do. Remember, we want to use common experience because that's the base where you start with everything. Any experiment is going to start with the fact that you see things and touch things and 
record things that you're seeing at the common experience level. So we, let's go to that mode of explanation, which is the, the baseline mode of explanation, and then see what we can understand. This is a very interesting point of investigation to understand what this, how this thing works, this Fechner's disk works. And it's not up to this point even really understood scientifically. But what we can say from our common experience is that, look, when I spin this, white is obviously not, it's is basically telling me something that I can tell from a prism, and that is that white is not a separate color. White is composed of other colors, and your eye has been fooled into decomposing it into the separate colors that are really there. And so basically we have our senses, we stop it and we see the thing is white. And we, our senses are, are basically at this extreme limit. And, and we can say, okay, well this is more evidence of the composition of colors. It's not that our senses are faulty, it's just that we've pushed it to a limit. And actually in one way they've revealed something about the unique nature of white. Now, uh, if I want to look at this, um, the black and white slides is another uh, interest example that, that just shows that the colors are composed, the white is composed of colors. And again, these are, these are calling for specialized experiments, but we just want to look and see what we can say at the common experience level. Now, TV scan, scan that seems like your, your senses have been totally um, fooled by that. Well, actually, if you look at a TV screen and you let your eyes sweep, say, two screens to the left and two screens to the white, to the right, what you'll see is the, the screen will break out into several pictures and the pictures will be slightly distorted. And what you're doing is you're actually breaking out the, the scanning and you're able to see the very, some of the various frames by doing that. So basically all we've sen seen then in doing this is that uh, the senses are trustworthy. As a matter of fact, the senses are the things we come back to to find out what we're seeing, whether what we're seeing is true or not true. And when we find an error in the senses, it's not an error per se in the senses, it's a limit of a particular sense that we have to then come back from the senses to say, okay, well, in, under this case, for example, this is stop, this is white, and that tells me, okay, that when it's spinning, there's, there's must be some other colors occurring inside here, and therefore white, and the colors are related to each other. But it all came from our senses. Our senses aren't a delusion, it's having to understand them what the senses are telling us, where problems can come in and mistakes can come in. If you assume that white is a different, if you came to the conclusion that white is a different thing than the colors before you looked at this, then you'll have false understanding of it. It won't have come from your senses though. The senses are trustworthy. They put us in contact with things. And the problem also comes when you start with a paradox. You should start with something in its natural state and work up to the paradox. If you start with the paradox, you're liable to get yourself tangled. And, and, and so the thing to note here is that we know the colors only because we can see. A blind man wouldn't know colors. He would know them by, say, some kind of um, metaphor. For example, take the case of a blind man, a man born blind, that's never seen a humming, hummingbird and how it responds and had never seen color. What he could do is he could set up an experiment with a red flower and a black flower, or a red painting of a flower and a black painting of a flower, and he could notice by hearing or by uh, feeling the air or whatever, that the bird comes up to the thing that people call red and avoids the thing that people call black. And he could come up with a sort of knowledge by substitution of red. And this is kind of our knowledge of atoms. This is the, kind of the way we know atoms. This is a, the metaphor through which he knows that this thing is red is a metaphor through which we know about atoms. In fact, the, the great physicist Arthur Eddington summarized all this by saying all physics is molar. And, and molar, to refresh your memory, means a mole of atoms, which is ba basically when you have that many atoms, a mole is like a do, you know, the equivalent of a dozen. It's, it's 10, to the, uh, in the 10 to the 23 and it's a lot of atoms. It's enough to be able to say that I can see something. So basically Eddington's statement is things that you can see and touch are where physics boils down to. M all physics is molar. That's what he meant. So all paradoxes have their resolution by trusting the senses. Forgetting all knowledge comes through the senses will lead to philosophical idealism. It will lead you to start in your head and once you get in your head there's no way out if, that, if that's where you start. 
Kant's epistemological idealism is default. Kant admits he doesn't know anything because he's starting within his head. Epistemologically, as they say, but we're going to simplify things here and just note that once you start as if all you know are your, if the, that you know your ideas and you have to get out to the outside world, you're not going to get there because you've cut off your route, which is through the senses. Now we're ready to talk about this thing sense of sensorial knowledge. As we've, we've realized that this is the first thing, we should understand what it is. For us, this is where knowledge begins. Is it physical change? Is it simply physical change? If I pick up this glass of water and I feel it cold, is that just because the glass cooled, uh, warmed up and my hands cooled down? No. There's something else going on besides that. I am aware of the coldness of the glass. In addition to those two physical changes that are happening, I, some, some ways I, in some way I apprehend or take hold of the coldness of the glass. I have changed in a unique way beyond the physical change. Knowledge is a unique species of change. Before we talk about this type of change, we need to then ground what is material change, because this is going to be a, obviously a diff if we don't understand the most basic type of change, which is material change, how are we going to understand this more complicated, more esoteric change, which is sensorial knowledge, wh whereby I'm aware of things. Well, after things are, the next thing we know very quickly after that is that they change. And there's two extremes that have happened in philosophy. Heraclitus and Parmenides had the two extremes. Heraclitus said, everything is change. And Parmenides came along and said, wait a second. Something has to be for it to change. And then he said, on top of that, um, nothing can really change because if it were to change, it would mean it would be and not be at the same time. And that's not possible, he said. So he said, everything is pure being. Everything is pure act absolutely unchanging, eternal, incorruptible, indivisible, having every perfection. So basically he assigned everything as being God. Of course, we don't have this direct knowledge of God. The first thing we know is not something that's unchangeable and perfect and all that stuff. The first thing we know is this thing that, that is something and then it changes into something else. So Parmenides neglected change, but he was the first one to see being, and that's a profound thing that he did because being is anything that, in, in this general definition, is not what you find in science fiction shows where a being is something with intelligence. But a being is anything that bees, anything that exists. And he saw clearly this idea. But let, let's see how we can expand on what he found. Let's start with an example, the growth of an apple. It starts with a small green size thing, and it grows to a red thing. Another example is... Um, if you're making a statue out of bronze, you say you make a statue of Einstein, you, you start with a blob and you chip it away until you have Einstein. So you change, you change, there's something that changes, and we call this the accidental form. The accidental form, here what happens is the, the form of this changes from a blob shape to an Einstein shape. In the a apple, the thing changes from green to red. So what we do with this word form is we extend its usage to not just apply to shape, but to any uh, property, we call it an accidental form when we mean that. So it's an analogical meaning. And accidental comes from the Latin word that has to do with accrete. So it's something that accretes onto a sub substance, you might want to say. It is, it is an accident or a property of the thing rather than the essence or substantial form. And we'll talk more about these, but let me give you the definition of substance an accident. Substance is that which exists of itself, not in another. Roughly you can think of as a, a thing. But try to think philosophically, try to start stretching your mind, that which exists of itself rather than in another. And an accident, or that which accretes, exi must exist in another. It's, you can think of it roughly as a property. So, and you know, don't feel overwhelmed by these ideas. This is what the whole book is going to be about. It's just a first introduction to these things, and they'll get, it'll, believe me, it'll get a lot easier as you hear these words used. Just try to get the first rough understanding now. Now, Aristotle proved rigorously that every material thing must have all these properties. The, they're called the nine accidents. Quantity, which is extension. Quality, which issues from a substance such as temperature, pressure, smell, color 
and properties involving relations in a strict sense, relation itself, action and reception, if something has the ability to, to act on something, something else must have the ability to receive that action, place, orientation, and the environment, and time. And we'll talk about all these. Mostly we'll be concentrating on quality and quantity. We have two types of change, accidental change and substantial change. Accidental change is what we said, like when an apple turns from green to red. It gets bigger and it changes color. That's a change in accidental form, change in property. Substantial ch change, that's if I take the apple, pluck it from a tree, and eat it. Well, at first the apple is part of the tree, but after I eat it, it's part of me. So, what, there's some, so what is preserved during this change is minimal. And the change from a green to a red apple is mostly the same thing, but when I m eat the apple, the apple is no longer in existence. This is a catastrophic change. We call that a substantial change because the substance of the tree, of which the apple was a part, now becomes a part of me. So the substance of the tree is gone and, and, the sub and, and it becomes part of the substance me. Still, any number of changes can be done to the apple, and I would still say that something persists during this change. You can hit this with neutrons, you can crush it, you can do all kinds of things, and I would still say that there's something there that doesn't change, and that's this idea of matter. It's this stuff that doesn't change under uh, all kinds of operations to it. We say, we say that then when I eat the apple, then the way we phrase this, we say the matter of the apple lost its substantial form and it became, took on the form of me. And now in similar cases, if you have an animal, an animal has a given substantial form, it's something that exists of itself. You know, like red has to exist in something else. I can't say there's a red, I have to say there's a red wall. But an animal is a substantial form, it's a thing that exists. It doesn't, it's not, it's a, not having to exist in something else. If an animal dies, then the animal is gone and replaced by the animal is a carcass. So the substantial form of the animal is lost and the substantial form of the little pieces that make up the carcass, the, the substantial forms of the little pieces that make up the carcass now are, are there instead. But yet there's some matter that was preserved. Indeed, I, I forget the numbers, but it's on the order of years, several years, whereby as we eat, after several years, we're not made up of the same matter anymore because we lose the old matter and we get new matter. Let's just pause a little bit and look at some of the words we're using because the words are very important for communicating the philosophical rigor that we're trying to establish to get this base firm. Essence is primarily the substantial form. And we'll get into the word essence a lot in the next chapter. Another word for it is nature, the nature of a thing, you say. Beware, because this has lots of different uses, this word nature. But a material substance, a body, is something, a form, but it is potentially something else. This is an apple, but it's potentially a part of me. The is of the apple, what it actually is, I call the form. What it potentially can become, I call the matter. So material being changeable being is all being that has this form matter composite. We'll come back to that more. But for now, let's, let's, we're, we've got enough to come back to sensorial knowledge a little bit. When we're using ima our imagination, that is, we're using images. For example, if you picture your wife, you, you have this image of the way she is in your mind. We call those phantasms or images. That's our sensorial knowledge, our previous experience, or our current experience of our, the, the, our wife um, that is mediated by our sensorial knowledge, which we'll explain the details of later. But be careful of these images. As I already pointed out about the train, the engine, and the coal car, the order of those things in your physical imagination is not the same as what, when you're thinking about something. When I'm thinking about the fact that a triangle implies the sides, that's not something you can imagine. That's not something that works in your imagination. That's something that works in your mind. And we'll make that distinction more clear as we go. So again, an accident can be thought to, it cannot be, it has to be thought to exist in another. And you have to be careful about this use of images. 
For example, you don't think of an accident as like nuts are in chocolate, because nuts in chocolate is an image. What you have to say is the accident is that which in, it exists, must exist in another. As I said, when I say there's a red, a red must, by its nature, it's an accident. It must exist in another. It doesn't exist in it as a separate substance, and it exists in it as part of that substance. Be careful of the confusing images. We'll come back to this idea more. Co again, a form matter composite is not to be imagined but thought about. Like the accident is in the substance, the form matter composite is a whole. So the problem of change. How can we answer Parmenides? Now that we've done all this, can we answer Parmenides? He says, look, change is impossible because so that's saying something is and then not is at the same time. I mean, is and not is. Well, the principle of contradiction, which we'll discuss a lot, this is a principle self-evident self because you cannot, you cannot deny it. Something cannot be and not be at the same time and in the same way. And this is the key, at the same time and in the same way. This is where Parmenides made his mistake. And this is where Aristotle fixed it. He came along later and fixed this mistake and said, look, changeable being, the type of being that we see all the time, is potentially, that is, it has this is-not aspect to it, and it actually is in a different way. So it doesn't violate the principle of contradiction. And Aristotle explained these things, and St. Thomas, uh, who lived in the 1200s, took them explicitly to their logical conclusions, and we'll talk more about that as we move along. So let's talk about the uh, act of being. To the degree something is, is to the degree that it is in act. Matter limits what a thing is. Matter allows there to be multiple individuals in a species. I can have a dog, uh, two dogs, because I can have one dog there and one dog there. The same substantial form of a dog actuates different matter. We can say Lassie and Rin Tin Tim, they both have the same substantial form, but they're informing different matter. So change, we can come to a definition now. The technical definition, and don't worry if you don't get this one quite right off the bat, it's a good thing to memorize, but it'll take a long time before you soak it in, in its depth. The, uh, Aristotle defines it as actu the actualization of the potential as such. Simply said, it's the change is not act in potentiality, but it's the potentiality in the process of becoming actuality. In the process, if it just is already, then it's not changing, or if it uh, already has changed, then it's not changing. It has to be in the process of becoming. Potentiality in the process of becoming actuality. While I'm eating the apple is when the change is happening, not before or after. We have the, the tools now to really understand sensorial knowledge. And with, so we've seen that this physical material change versus change of sensorial knowledge. We've seen there's a difference. In, in this example, when I pick this up, my skin cooled down and my glass cooled, warmed up. But something else happened. I'm aware, I become in some way, I'm conscious of the coldness of the glass, I in some way become, without losing myself, the coldness of the glass. The physical changes, the, it's not a physical change, because remember in physical change, you have a certain matter and it gets a different form. So if I'm if I'm going to become, if it's a physical change, a purely physical change, then when I take on the form, then I become it. If I want to uh, take the coldness, then I have to change into the coldness, and I'm not there anymore. That's obviously not what's happening. You're not losing one form and gaining another. You're say, taking the form of the thing, the coldness of my glass, as that particular form. So instead of one form being changed into another, I receive the form of the coldness of the glass in, in a unique way. I receive it as the form of the object, not as the form of me. So this is, we, we have to say this is not material, because as we said, material change in, involves losing one form and gaining a new form. We don't lose a form in this case, we have to come up with a different type of change. And that is, uh, th this being is called an immaterial, not material or also spiritual. For right now though, notice that we've said everything comes from the senses, but we've used some principles to deduce all the things that we've said about the sensorial knowledge, the fact that it's this immaterial, not material type of change. And um, 
that implies this higher ability, this abstract knowledge, the general as opposed to the particular that's given. When I see this glass, it's this particular glass. When I feel the coldness, it's this particular coldness. The general ideas are more general. The abstract ideas like the principle of contradiction is a general thing. So we'll have to look into that. That's the source of the material for the next chapter. But notice the most important thing we've done in this, in this lecture is we've moved, notice that you must always move from what is more known to what is less known. Start with what you know and then move outward. Be careful not to start way at the end because you can make yourself really confused and you can lose your, your way very quickly. Again, we have used no results from modern science to say these things. We've used things that are accessible by common experience. If we used modern science, we would make them less certain rather than more because there would be things that we had used beforehand that we did not make explicit. Thank you.